Hi, uh, my name is Danny Chen, and I'm an engineer in the Trading Solutions SRE team at Bloomberg. As the title of this talk suggests, uh, uh, I'm going to be uh, covering uh, leveraging latency distributions and micro benchmarks uh, to detect and identify kernel hotspots. And the case studies that are uh, presented will make clear the uh, cases for uh, using these tools. Uh, but when we take a step back and look at the nature of the hotspots that we're going to identify, uh, uh, there are also lessons uh, related to uh, uh, protecting cr critical regions in the kernel and kernel support for monitoring of large uh, environments. In terms of my background, uh, I've been doing Unix performance engineering since uh, starting my career at Bell Labs in 1980. Uh, some key highlights of my performance work there include uh, co-developing the first general purpose kernel tracing package for Unix, and uh, virtual memory and demand paging improvements in uh, Unix SBR3 and SBR4, uh, with both of which I presented papers on at uh, uh, Usenix general technical conferences way back in 1988 and uh, 1990. An important part of my experience uh, was my participation in the performance management working group in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, the, the PMWG was an industry-wide standards effort uh, to establish performance management interfaces and practices for Unix. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, that effort failed, uh, which is kind of unfortunate because there are some guidelines and principles that some of us were trying to push uh, through the uh, group that would have been useful today. Uh, so so my some of my recent professional efforts include revisiting some uh, lost art and promoting uh, uh, getting more engineering back in performance engineering. Uh, to that end, I've, uh, since I've joined Bloomberg, I I've given a number of talks at SRECon and, and Lisa. So if you find this talk interesting, uh, you might want to uh, look for my other talks uh, and previous SRECons and Lisa's. In some ways, this talk is about scale. Uh, all, all of the case studies that I'm presenting involve large systems. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, horizontal scaling is a common ma mantra these days, and, and for good reason. If your application uh, requirements allow for uh, remote calls and remote shared state, then scaling your system up to a certain point uh, becomes relatively easy. But sometimes one's requirement uh, either uh, require the lower latency of uh, local IPC mechanisms or greater assurances about the uh, durability of rights or even fine-tuned control of resource uh, allocation and scheduling. And uh, that's why uh, we uh, in our department uh, run on large uh, bare metal boxes. Just to give you an idea of the scale that our department uh, runs on, uh, we run across uh, three different OS platforms, uh, a total of over 400,000 processes across hundreds of uh, physical machines. Uh, on some of the busier hosts, uh, five to 8,000 processes, and on uh, busier hosts, uh, over 250,000 threads. Let's just uh, jump into our case studies. Uh, the, the this first problem occurred on AIX, uh, on production machines, where uh, general system slowness was observed. And a common strategy of ours uh, to kind of differentiate between a workload and machine state is to migrate the load from one machine in a cluster to another one. Uh, uh, in this case, the, the slowness traveled with the load. So uh, to narrow down the problem, uh, uh, we use the AIX trace utility, which is analogous to Truss on Solaris and S-Trace on Linux, uh, to identify sporadic seminit and sem destroy times as a big source of latency in some um, uh, sample utilities that uh, run. Uh, note that it took us a couple of days from the detection of slowness and the detection of the semaphore create, op create and destroy operations as a suspect. And because the semaphore operations uh, were sometimes fast and sometimes slow, uh, we theorized that the variability was due to contention within concurrent applications of the uh, semaphore calls. To test out this hypothesis, uh, I wrote a small micro benchmark, uh, basically creating and destroying semaphores in a tight loop. Uh, inside the blue box uh, is the output of the time command on 3 million iterations of, of this loop. So, so no, a note that now, this benchmark is only creating and destroying semaphores. Um, it's not doing any uh, synchronization or serialization with the semaphores. Uh, so, so it looks like it should be a pure CPU program loop. Um, and we, uh, here, we would expect that um, on an otherwise idle system, the user and system CPU time should add up to the wall time. 
here we see from this output that is clearly not the case. Uh, uh, luckily, I've encountered this behavior on AIX before, so I didn't waste time chasing down this missing time. Uh, we're operating this host in uh, hyperthreading mode, and on AIX in hyperthreading mode, the CPU time is no longer measuring the time spent running on a, uh, uh, a thread. Uh, um, it's instead some fudge metrics that's not uh, 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 kind of presenting CPU time. And, and this is a known feature of AIX. Um, uh, it, it, again, this, this is a really major break in the behavior of AIX in hyperthreading mode. And if the, uh, if the PMWG hadn't uh, failed, uh, we might have something like a POSIX for performance, uh, which would uh, uh, nix uh, some uh, 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 break in behavior like this. Because uh, this means that all the tools that do CPU reporting, including profiling, is d discounting the CPU usage of, of processes. And for us, uh, we lose a bit of information because uh, we can no longer rely on um, this invariant of the uh, user and system time adding up to wall clock time uh, for, for CPU bound code. Right? Uh, but, but we can still get some information out of a benchmark. Um, uh, uh, by running concurrent instances of a benchmark, you can see how long uh, the elongation of wall, wall clock time and, and its behavior. And, and here in, in this table, uh, we're presenting that. Uh, each row represents um, the, uh, the number of concurrent instances and the uh, wall time uh, per, the average wall time per instance and uh, the user and C uh, system CPU time per instance. Uh, so uh, what would we expect to see? Well, uh, if it were pure CPU code that had no uh, shared critical sections, then uh, we would expect that up to at least a number of physical cores, the wall and CPU times for each instance would be the same as for a single instance. Uh, here we see the wall time increasing with concurrency. Uh, so one, um, conjecture we could make is that there's at least one critical region in the sem init and sem destroy uh, system calls that the kernel's protecting against that results in serialization, uh, which uh, is elongating the wall time. Uh, the, the, the system times are also increasing. So what that says is that uh, some of that serialization uh, is, um, is uh, uh, spin locks. Um, again, uh, the system time in AIX is uh, incorrectly discounted. Um, but uh, the, the wall time and system time ratio remains relatively constant at around 60%. So it might be reasonable to say that the um, uh, wall time is actually the um, CPU time, uh, which is mainly the system time. So, so uh, again, given these increments in time with concurrency, it's even further you know, reasonable to kind of say that the, the spin locks are, um, operate on a significant portion of the full system call. So uh, what did we learn here? Um, First, uh, to not trust AIU, AIX CPU measurements uh, when running in hyperthreaded mode. Um, also, um, uh, an important uh, point is that uh, there are no out-of-the-box metrics on System 5 IPC operations. It took us days to isolate the problem down to uh, seminate and sem destroy system calls. Uh, we, we have uh, kernel performance groups that uh, work on AIX, Solaris, and Linux. And our AIX team was able to uh, run the AIX equivalent of uh, Solaris's lock stack. Uh, to confirm that uh, there was indeed a coarse grain spin lock that protects sem init and sem destroy, and that two calls have critical regions that are protected by different spin locks. Uh, uh, so, uh, and the thing here is that spin locks are good when contention is low, uh, but as we see uh, on our busy systems, when con contention is high, the spin locks um, are uh, uh, not so good. Our second case occurred on Linux. Uh, in this situation, uh, we were getting tickets uh, were reporting drop messages from low-level applications infrastructure. The, this infrastructure leverages a combination of System 5 message queues and shared memory to implement a form of zero-copy messaging. Uh, but what was causing these slow consumers? In this case, the problem was relatively easy to identify because the infrastructure reports when SHMAT latency exceeds a certain threshold. And we were able to easily correlate large SMAT latencies with uh, message drops. So uh, what could cause SMAT to be slow? Again, we suspected contention. Uh, so I uh, wrote another micro benchmark. And, and note the similarity with the previous benchmark. A and again, look at the blue box for the timings of a single instance run. Uh, here we see that even though we again expect a pure CPU process, the user and system time also does not add up to wall clock time, but this time the reason has more to do with the um, testing environment. Uh, 
uh, this problem occurred what was encountered on a rel 6 and i no longer had access to a standalone rel 6 environment for data for this talk so this data was taken off a busy, busy dev system and the difference uh, we see uh, is likely due to uh, contention, uh, background contention, uh, uh, which we see in the kind of two row table that I have here. A single instance takes uh, 2.3 seconds of C system CPU time, but four concurrent instances take a whopping 33.6 seconds of CPU time each. And again, uh, this time we have uh, no out of the box metrics on uh, system five IPC latencies. Uh, but the zero copy messaging subsystem at least uh, put warnings out uh, when the shamat uh, takes too long. So they probably encountered this problem before. Uh, and uh, as a result, the potential culprit was uh, pretty easily uh, identified. And again, it looks like there's a uh, coarse grain spin locking and maybe something more because of all that system time on, con uh, on concurrency. Uh, and we've said before, that uh, you know, these the spin locks are really good when the contention is low, but uh, uh, bad when contention is high. Uh, our, our saving grace here was that the problem occurred on RHEL 6, and we found the uh, behavior uh, much improved in RHEL 7.6. Uh, but it is interesting to note that uh, 7.4 was even worse than RHEL 6. So uh, performance improvements are, are not monotonic, and sometimes performance gets worse before it gets better. In fact, a lot of times, uh, performance regressions come back in cycles as different uh, developers and different teams undo the work of previous developers because of you know, different mental models uh, and ways to approach things. Uh, th th this makes it uh, really important for us as uh, users of these OSs to keep a suite of these uh, micro benchmarks uh, to, to, to detect uh, potential performance regressions. Our next case study uh, involves Solaris and some critical identity management infrastructure with uh, very strict uh, latency SLOs. In this case, the culprit was extremely easy to identify because the team responsible for the identity management software had the foresight to collect latency distributions for uh, a key SLI, uh, token generation times. So, so we were able to see that the max token generation time jumped uh, from single digit milliseconds to over 250 milliseconds while the mean and even the 99th percentile stayed in uh, single milliseconds. Uh, my team lead was able to go through process logs to correlate these spikes to the invocation of a single netstat call. So uh, let me repeat, a single netstat call was able to cause the tail of the token generation latency uh, to jump from single milliseconds to 250 milliseconds. Before I delve into the mystery of the incredibly impactful netstat, uh, I want to take a short diversion and highlight the importance of using histograms and distributions to uh, characterize latency. Uh, in the previous slide, we saw that by capturing the max value of a key SLI, we were, we were able to really easily correlate a large performance hit with a single netstat invocation. The uh, median value of the SLI didn't move, and, and even the, the uh, 90th and 99th percentiles moved uh, very little in this example, but there are other instances uh, uh, where uh, a single net stat caused a spike in the uh, 90th percentile as well. So, so most of the time, uh, we do ourselves a, a big disservice when we summarize latencies uh, in, into uh, means or even medians. A, a single number just doesn't cut it uh, to give uh, information about what's often a, a really large data set. Uh, and at the very least, knowing something about the spread can be really useful, but the go-to measure for spread is usually standard deviation or variance. And unfortunately, the mean and standard deviation are only uh, not misleading if the distribution of data is a normal distribution, uh, which is rarely the case in uh, the, the kind of computer system of SLIs. Uh, uh, histograms are a, a relatively compact way of keeping track of the shape of the latency distribution and, and, and to allow for fine-grained detection of performance hiccups. In this slide, I've pulled an example histogram that I presented in my loggers talk uh, at SRECon uh, previously. Uh, th this histogram uh, represents logging uh, write times that I collected in, uh, from a small uh, sample Java program. And as you can see, even something as simple as logging, a, a fixed size uh, log line, can have a wide, non-normal distribution with a really long tail. So now back to our case number three. Uh, again, we have no out-of-the-box metrics on uh, uh, socket operation latency. Uh, it's a common theme uh, we're hearing now, right? Uh, but luckily, the subsystem uh, maintained latency distributions for uh, key SLIs, uh, in this case, uh, the token generation latency. Uh, this allowed us to quickly identify 
uh, runs up NETSTAT as the causes of SLO violations. Uh, but why did a single uh, NETSAT have such a large impact on uh, token generation? And, and why uh, did this happen only on our systems? Well, it turns out that uh, the token generation software leverages Unix domain sockets uh, to communicate and uh, validate identity. And the standard NETSTAT minus an A invocation that everybody reflexively uses also lists all the Unix domain sockets on the system. So in, in Solaris, uh, getting a list of all Unix domain sockets is via uh, the, the KSTAT system. And programmatically, uh, NETSTAT makes IOCTAL calls to get that information. So it, it turns out that in order to walk the, long, the linked list of data structures that uh, get all the Unix domain sockets, KSTAT needs to lock that list. Because if you're walking a linked list and uh, sockets are being created and destroyed, uh, you won't be able to walk that list uh, reliably unless you lock it. So while NETSTAT is getting all the Unix domain sockets, creation of Unix domain sockets is blocked. Uh, ouch. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, why do these violations happen more frequently on our systems? Uh, well, it turns out that on our systems, we have lots of Unix domain sockets. Uh, and so uh, it would seem that uh, this problem would uh, correlate with a large number of sockets. Uh, and unfortunately, the only way to count the number of uh, Unix domain sockets is to run NetStat, so, uh, uh, which we're now trying our best to avoid running. Uh, so uh, we needed a way to test this conjecture uh, that the number of uh, Unix domain sockets contributes to this behavior. Another micro benchmark to the rescue. Uh, but this time, we weren't looking uh, for contention. We, uh, we were looking to just create a known number of Unix domain sockets and then measure the amount of time NetStat holds uh, its, lo its lock. Uh, the amount of time NetStat uh, uh, makes that IOCTL call as a function of the number of Unix domain sockets. And, and along the way, we found some interesting behavior. Uh, this table doesn't represent uh, concurrent execution of instances. It describes sequential runs. So after each sequential run, a successful run, uh, the, the system has 32K more Unix domain sites than, it, than before it ran. Uh, but notice what's happening with each successive run. Both the wall time and the system time are increasing, even though each run creates a constant 32,000 sockets. So the cost of creating a Unix domain socket is a function of the number of existing Unix domain sockets. Uh, th this table also stops at six rows because at some point creating a uni new Unix domain socket hangs indefinitely. Given that we knew that there are locks in socket creation that could get impacted by NETSTAT, we also created concurrency versions of the benchmark, uh, the socket creation benchmark to test behavior under contention. Uh, we identified hotspots with these benchmarks and sent uh, all these benchmarks to uh, Oracle. So again, another advantage of having micro benchmarks is that you can package them up re really easily and have people reproduce problems, right? Um, that they came back with uh, fixes and improvements uh, to be included in uh, Solaris 11.4. Uh, including an interface to uh, return the number of Unix, Unix domain sockets without traversing the list of sockets. Uh, these uh, changes are currently being tested and uh, they look promising. Our final test case is again on Linux, uh, this time on RHEL 7.6. Uh, the, the investigation is uh, just beginning and a work in progress, so I'm presenting an early view uh, right now. Uh, in this case, uh, we've started to see timeouts and startup and shutdown on Linux if the host has more than uh, 256 threads. Um, so could, could it be that the task creation and destruction also degrade rapidly with contention? Here, as with Unix domain sockets on Solaris, we just wrote a small program to create many background threads that do no work. Here you'll notice that uh, with more threads, PS takes progressively longer, uh, even though PS is not being asked to report on threads, just processes. And we saw similar growth uh, in system time if we simply uh, do an ls on slash proc. So uh, looking at the uh, relevant slash proc code in the kernel uh, shows that both processes and threads are kept in a, a single or doubly linked uh, task list in the kernel. So when you ls slash proc, you're, you're actually walking through a task list and finding uh, the top level processes. So it makes sense that uh, when you have tons of threads, a simple PS will take longer. Um, and, and this by itself um, really uh, shouldn't be a problem, uh, except maybe to call out that uh, you might want to optimize around getting processes instead of um, having to go through all these tasks to get processes. But then a colleague noticed that concurrent PS runs seem to serialize each other, uh, which you can kind of see in the uh, time output in the blue boxes here. And, and this kind of makes sense uh, since uh, it needs to traverse a linked list. Uh, uh, and uh, again, 
uh, if you're uh, traversing a linked list, you need to lock the list against changes. Uh, so that's a, a kind of a, a, mo a, a modify lock, right? Um, uh, but, and, and this problem sounds very much like the nest that problem on Solaris, right? So um, it, it's uh, very possible that PS uh, or anything that examines uh, slash proc uh, impacts um, uh, forks, exits, pthread create, and pthread destroys, which kind of insert and delete the tasks on this um, linked list. Um, uh, and a question this opens up, uh, which uh, it seems likely, is that concurrent task creates and destroys uh, can impact each other as well. Uh, so that these questions that uh, are, are, are we're in the process of uh, answering with more experiments. In closing, there are a lot of points that I'd like you all to walk away with. Um, the first is that uh, systems are not infinitely scalable. Uh, there are engineering assumptions and decisions uh, baked into implementations that will uh, limit scale. Um, the scale could be uh, size or it could be contention. Uh, but we do want to identify when that overhead is uh, kind of super linear. Uh, latency histograms are, are gr great tools to help spot hiccups and uh, also for characterizing the behavior of systems. Uh, single numbers like means and medians uh, just don't cut it. Uh, and, and if we think of the system call interface as just another user library, uh, we can write useful micro benchmarks to uh, test the performance of the kernel and characterize behavior. Right? And, and th these micro benchmarks are great uh, for reproducing the problem and, and passing it on to others. And they're also complementary to kind of kernel lock tracing tools. One, one of the problems with uh, running uh, straight kernel lock tracing in production, aside from the overhead, uh, is uh, that there's just a lot of noise, a lot of data, and weeding through that uh, is very difficult. But if you can isolate uh, the uh, contention with a micro benchmark, then uh, you, you can kind of see uh, zero in on what's going on. But the thing to be aware of is uh, you know, designing to the benchmark. Right? Uh, here, we're creating a lot of contention. Some of it uh, is unrealistic to, to highlight behavior. And you, you don't necessarily want to kind of design, in going back to the OS vendors to say, we don't want them to design uh, uh, with um, possibly unreasonable contention. So, uh, so, so here, again, uh, list latency histograms are really important to make sure that the behavior you get back after a change um, uh, has uh, really improved the system. And this is more of a plea to kernel folks. Um, when I was uh, working in uh, kernel performance, uh, we had a prime directive uh, of non-interference uh, that the uh, uh, monitoring uh, systems or the monitoring implementations should not uh, impact uh, the kernel, or at least impact as little as possible. And it's one of the principles that a group of us uh, in the PMWG try to push forward into a standard. Again, uh, the lack of a POSIX for performance, um, I think, is hurting us. But we, we, when we have a monitoring um, implementation that impacts the system under observation, uh, we wind up telling users not to uh, use it so much. Um, we, uh, and we don't want to tell users not to run Metstat or not to run PS. It, it defeats the purpose of having these tools. And in retrospect, uh, Unix's old style of the dev KMEM interface uh, to getting monitoring data uh, facilitated this uh, kind of um, um, non-interaction somewhat. Uh, when going through dev KMEM, uh, you could not interact with the code, even if you uh, wanted to. Uh, and, and a kernel module who, that wanted to be monitored via dev KMEM would design the data structures to be um, amenable to, uh, to that style of access. Uh, you had to make it relatively easy to, uh, to uh, seek to and, and read the, the data. Having to walk through a kernel linked list via dev KMEM is uh, nearly impossible, uh, or, or at least uh, highly impractical. Uh, and you know the slash proc is a great user interface, but allowing monitoring opera operations to impact kernel operations, again, results in uh, less than useful monitoring. Uh, I have lots of ideas around this, uh, so reach out to me directly if you want to discuss this more. Uh, also, one uh, common theme in our case studies uh, is the lack of visibility. It would be wonderful if we could get counts and latencies around system calls and key lock acquisitions. Uh, I've put together some uh, references for uh, people uh, who uh, want to uh, get into this more. Uh, um, even though um, I cut um, a reference to John Bentley's uh, um, talk uh, in, in this talk uh, for the purpose of time, uh, he gave a talk in uh, 2007 at a Google Tech Talk on performance bugs. It's a great viewing if you're into performance engineering. I highly recommend it. And then uh, there's a strong case for histograms being made by other people.
uh, Il Tene uh, has a, a, a bunch of YouTube uh, and, and writings uh, that make the case. And uh, Fred Moyer at a previous uh, SRECon also made the case for um, uh, using histograms for latencies. Uh, thank you, and uh, we're hiring.